Why is it nobody else is reporting on this? Um, well, I guess I could. I, I don't really know exactly why that would be, but the the silence is very eerie about major aspects of the Epstein case. The way you have written about him, it connects to a whole world of corruption. Yeah. Is he kind of the Rosetta Stone? Yeah, I think it's sort of like a meta scandal. You're looking at someone who really had, I guess, for lack of a better metaphor, had his hands in a lot of pies. Right. Yeah, right. So he was sort of at the center of a lot of scandals, but not necessarily at the top. Right. I think he was more maybe middle management in a sense, but very central to a lot of these things going on that sort of these um, networks in which he um, in which he inhabits are involved in, you know, numerous uh, acts of corruption simultaneously. Yeah. And he, you know, is there involved in many of them, but not necessarily at the top level. Right. So was he was he a spy? I think he definitely had intelligence connections. And there's a lot, um, you know, to suggest that was the case. I think one of the most uh, the earliest hints we heard of that was having a secretary of labor, Alex Acosta, under mm-hmm. Trump, uh, say that one of the reasons he was pressured into giving Epstein a sweetheart deal, deal during his first um, arrest in, in Florida was because he, he had been told by unspecified actors that Epstein belonged to intelligence. But that's kind of, you know. What exactly does that mean? Was he an asset? Was he on the payroll? Which intelligence agency? Multiple intelligence agencies? When you have his close association with someone like Ghislaine Maxwell in the mix and her father had affiliations with numerous intelligence agencies, you know, it really is an open question. He was kind of a bad guy. (laughs) I'm reading your work about him and explain who he was. Uh, So Robert Maxwell was involved in many things, uh, but he definitely played a major role in undermining U.S. national security by selling bug software to nuclear laboratories in the United States. Um, And this was directly facilitated by well-known statesmen. In U.S. history, like Henry Kissinger, for Mm. example, and a lot of the people I think that enabled him, at least on the U.S. side, tend to be those that uh, favor global governance and, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. they kind of don't want the U.S. to have that kind of monopoly on on power. Because all of his family, they were killed in the Holocaust, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he he's in the West, England. Mm -hmm. Uh, He survives, becomes kind of uh, William Randolph Hearst of England. Would yeah, media mogul, sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and then betrays the West. And that's not because he, gets, he was on the yeah. other, he wasn't on the Soviet side. He was on a global government side. Well, I think there you have to look at this network and they've evolved over time. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, Robert Maxwell is very close to the Eastern Bloc. He had a very close relationship with intelligence figures in the KGB and also Bulgaria. He had a relationship with British intelligence and Israeli intelligence mm-hmm. and was involved in aspects of uh, what later became known as Iran Contra, which, of course, involves aspects mm-hmm. of U.S. intelligence. So, I mean, he had his hands and, you know, everywhere and everything. And it- I think ultimately people like him are interested in. Uh, Any deal they can make to advance their money and their power and their influence, they'll take it. So Robert Maxwell was very interested in having his family be like the Kennedy family, a political power dynasty. Um, And that's part of why he started moving into New York City around, you know, just a year or two before he ended up dying. And Ghislaine Maxwell was sent to New York sort of to be his emissary. Um, Wow. Into the U.S. And he wanted her actually to marry a Kennedy. And this is attested to in, you know, past mainstream media reports. And you, know, you can see his, his efforts to get her close to, I think, uh, one of the sons of Robert F. Kennedy um, and also John, uh, John F. Kennedy Jr. trying to get her sort of in that social social tier because he sort of saw that as, you know, w- would advance his power and also, you know, that of his children. And I think if you look a lot at the psychology of Robert Maxwell, he seems to have had narcissistic elements and that could be because of the trauma um, of his past. And a lot of times narcissistic parents see their children as extensions of themselves. Yeah. And so, you know, that he's looking at how to build an empire and using uh, his children to that effect. And you sort of see that with the psychology of Ghislaine Maxwell so as is well. So Ghislaine, uh, it was she part and parcel of from the beginning or was she uh you know kind of a good girl idealistic comes over here you know knows that dad wants to put her into powerful positions but 
not shopping women? I, I think it's a lot more complicated than that. You have to look at her early history. Um, the favorite son of Robert Maxwell was originally Michael Maxwell. He uh, was in a vegetative state after a car crash, I think, when he was 15. Mm. And that happened shortly after, just a few days after Ghislaine was born. So new, her family members and she herself have attested to that she was basically neglected for the first three years of her life and even developed a childhood anorexia. Things like that. And then, you know, not a few years after, she becomes the favorite child. So she goes from having this complete lack of parental attention to being sort of showered in it mm-hmm. by Robert Maxwell. Mm-hmm. And that obviously has, is going to have a psychological impact on someone. And in um, addition, there's a, she was basically uh, managed by her father from a very early age. He managed her, uh, tried to manage her romantic life. He tried to manage what job she would have, and she was very dependent on him. So when he is dead in 1991, it makes sense that she would attach herself to someone with a lot of the similar, similar mm. characteristics, right? So mm-hmm. dad didn't know about... Uh, Jeffrey Epstein wasn't alive at that point? Well, the allegation have been made by people that worked with Robert Maxwell um, in the 80s that um, Jeffrey Epstein was seen in his offices frequently in the United Kingdom. And during that period of time, it was known that Epstein was active in the United Kingdom. He was allegedly being mentored by a British arms dealer named Douglas Lease with a British intelligence connections. God. First of all, you wrote two volumes on yeah, this. Yeah, a thousand pages. Yeah, I mean, that is crazy amounts of work. Yeah, and I had my son was born in the middle of it, so it was really crazy. You yeah. were there for that, I imagine, when your son was born. Um, so tell me, a thousand pages, and it's not, there's no fluff in it. I mean, it is. It's dense. It's very dense. Mm-hmm. Why is it nobody else is reporting on this? Um, well, I guess I could, I, I don't really know exactly why that would be, but the, the silence is very eerie about major aspects of the Epstein case. Um, you know, it ended up being a thousand pages because I was, as I was writing about Epstein, a lot of the connections uh, that came up, I was, I was just, you know, increasingly aware that a lot of people in the American public, um, you know, a lot of the names I was coming across, most people weren't going to be familiar with. Correct. You know, um, banks like the Bank of Credit and Commerce International or BCCI, the scandal that involved, or even things like Iran Contra, people may have heard the name but don't really know what it involved. Mm-hmm. So I figured I was going to have to go back and sort of right. um, explain that to people. So that type of con text is a uh, volume one of the book and um and also the history of sexual blackmail and how it's been sort of an undercurrent in some past political scandals um, in American history and how in, in these sorts of networks in which Epstein was inhabiting that type of practice and exploitation even of minors for those purposes was actually um, disturbingly common. So Epstein starts to look less and less of a, uh, you know, he's not an anomaly, basically. Right. Um, by the time you get through with volume one. And so volume two is sort of my effort to, um, you know, dig up as much as I could, you know, with stuff that's uh, publicly available really um, about Epstein and also uh, his greatest benefactor, Leslie Wexner, and then also, uh, you know, Ghislaine Maxwell. 